This presentation for NCTA will be focusing on how American ideas about China, often fantasies about China, that exaggerate either the potential for it be, to be, become a country much like our own, or that emphasize the differences and often the sort of fearful differences of it. Um, it will look at the history of this sort of rise and fall of positive and negative images about China, and how these positive and negative images of China relate to positive and negative images of other parts of the world. So what I'll be talking about is what I call the American China dream and the American China nightmare. And as I've just explained, the American China dream is this fantasy that China is just a few years or one good leader away of somehow converging in a very happy way with American norms. Um, this has been taken root in different times with an idea of, of Chinese conversion. Early on, it was an idea of Chinese conversion to Christianity. At a later point, it was Chinese conversion to liberal democracy. Um, at another point, it, it might have been that China and the United States would pull together via a conversion of patterns of consumption and sort of having similar middle classes. And in some ways, now we're in this interesting case where all ideas of that convergence are in some ways up for grabs because China has become in some ways a country um, very like the United States when it comes to things like fashion, consumerism. Um, we're very intertwined, and yet there is still this sense of, of great difference. And the American China nightmare is about is a tendency to see China as impossibly different, but impossibly different in a scary way. Um, an idea that China poses a threat to everything we hold dear, and that somehow China will take over the world and try to force us to convert to, to their ways, or will simply be uninterested in forming a kind of happy um, coalition. The other thing that I'll be talking about throughout this is what I call the J China Japan seesaw effect. And here I draw in part, as in all of these, and things that other um, scholars and journalists have been talking about. And in this case, Sheila Johnson has a book, a um, very good book, that talks about shifting views of Japan in the American imagination. And one of the things drawing on her is that there seems to be a long-term tendency that when China is up, Japan is down. Um, and when Japan is up, China is down. That often, though not always, Americans have hopes invested in China and fears about Japan, or hopes about Japan and fears invested in China. And there may be some other things, uh, patterns that will come up as well. Throughout this, I'll talk periodically about what might be called Sinomania, um, this idea, this admiration for China, um, which we've seen show up in various ways from as far back as the time of Marco Polo and Voltaire, both of whom sometimes talked about things that China did um, incredibly well, that they could use the things that they admired about China in part to critique things in the West. And we see this sometimes at play um, in America now, it relates to the China dream and China nightmare, but it's a bit different. You sometimes see people saying, if only we could be as efficient as the Chinese government is, if only we could put, do infrastructure projects as, um, as quickly as um, China does. Um, there's been some, even people who are quite critical of the Chinese government some of the time express um, the idea that I think, as Thomas Friedman once put it, wouldn't it be great if we could be like China for a day, if we could just get things done? And I think um, this notion, whereas in the past, sometimes it was about China standing out as kind of admirable due to moral, morality codes and things like that, now it's often really about efficiency. And things like the government shutdowns in the United States have led some people to think that maybe it wouldn't be so bad even if morally there are problems with an authoritarian system, if it's one that's very efficient in the way that the Chinese one seems to be, wouldn't it be great if some aspects of that would rub off on us?
along with that and throughout history, there's been a periodic sinophobia. And this goes back very far. Um, there are periods of it back centuries um, when there's this fear rooted in China's size, the size of its population, um, the idea that China, or and it's not always China because it can be things related to China, such as the fear of the Mongol hordes. The fear uh, goes back as far as fears of Genghis Khan. If that, that China in some ways stands out as this, this great threat. And periodically that resurfaces, and it's resurfaced in recent, um, recent years and recent decades as well. So when I talk about the American China dream, here are some of the images uh, from periods that I'll return to as I go on that talk about, um, that, that evoke visually some kinds of ideas about convergence of a kind of overcoming the difference between the countries for um, the countries to work smoothly together in ways that um, seem positive to Americans. And then when I talk about the American China nightmare, these are images, again, that I'll return to uh, when getting to the periods um, in question that look for different embodiments of the China threat of this vision. And one thing that you'll notice is that when the American China dream is in ascent, you'll see China represented more often by pandas. And when you see the American China nightmare in ascent, you'll see representations of China as a, as a dragon. And in, in Chinese um, folklore, dragons can be positive and wise, but in the American negative fantasies about China, you'll see it as a menacing dragon, as a dragon that is out to do harm. So here is a very quick march through time from 1900 to the present um, with some moments when the Chinese nightmare, American China nightmare was in ascent. One moment when it was in ascent, it was during the Boxer Movement of 1900. The Boxers were an anti-Christian group who lashed out against um, the presence of foreigners and the foreign religion in China, believing that the terrible drought that was afflicting North China was due to local gods withholding rain to show their displeasure with the presence of the land of foreign objects, including railway tracks and foreign, the foreign religion. The boxers attacked missionaries. They killed some missionaries and even some missionaries' children. But they killed a larger number of Chinese Christians, seeing um, missionaries as foreign devils and Chinese Christians as secondary devils. During this period, the, the crisis reached a, a peak, at least in the, um, the foreign imagination, when the boxers allied with Qing dynasty troops and trapped foreigners, uh, the foreign diplomats and their families in um, Beijing's diplomatic quarter for 55 days. And then a foreign army made up of troops marching behind the banners of eight different nations and empires, including the United States, as well as various European countries and Japan and Russia, took over Beijing, defeated the boxers and the Qing, and freed the foreigners held captive there. But images circulated that showed the boxers as utterly bloodthirsty fanatics, and by extension presented China as being defined by a place that was deeply xenophobic, that had this undying hatred um, of the West, and that was something to be feared. And even some of the images of the boxers, the images of the boxers would mock them. Um, they got their name, the boxers, because they were sometimes called the fist bandits in Chinese because of their use of martial arts techniques, that they also used swords and other weapons. But the boxers were mocked because they had superstitious beliefs, but there was also a fear of them. There was that the idea that if this, if this belief in lashing out against the foreigners um, took hold among a large, a large um, sector of this enormous population, maybe the West, even with its strong guns, would not be able to stand up to it. There were some people who challenged um, um, this view of China in 1900, um, not so much because, only very rarely, because they thought that the boxers were a good group, but rather they thought that actually weren't what the boxers doing and others trying to get control of their land back uh, into the hands of their own country. Because throughout the late 19th century, China, the Qing dynasty had lost a series of wars against foreign powers. 
and foreign powers had exacted uh, more and more concessions from the Chinese. And there were, uh, and the Manchu, uh, so the Qing, who, who ruled China at the time. So some people saw that whether, even if the boxers were lashing out in, in cruel and terrible ways, that the Western powers had a lot to answer for. And when foreign troops invaded China and lifted the siege, um, they then carried out some quite vicious campaigns of revenge and retribution in the name of ridding the country of boxers, but in the process killing many innocent Chinese who had, had no um, connection to the group. But anyway, during this time, in part because of the real atrocities that had taken place committed by the boxers, there was the Chinese, the American Chinese nightmare was at its highest. Another instantiation of the American Chinese nightmare that had some elements of both difference and the use of, um, of advanced technologies came during the Cold War when um, during the red scares, uh, the red fears, the fears of red China of the 1950s and early 1960s, um, China was seen as feared both because of its kind of masses, numbers of people who would follow along um, and lash out against the West, kind of like the boxers had. And the Communist Party leaders sometimes viewed the boxers as heroes because the boxers had, had fought against imperialism. But then also this was a, a country that was particularly dangerous because it was allied with other dangerous foreign powers, uh, the Soviet Union um, that was at odds with the United States and also was getting more and more advanced um, weapons. And the idea of China getting um, the atomic bomb was something that, um, sent, that caused great fear for those who saw this American, uh, were obs obsessed with this American uh, China nightmare. Now, a lot of times the nightmare was based partly in things that were actually going on, but was exacerbated and um, magnified um, by ongoing fantasies that had a great deal to do with racism and fears rooted in um, the past. Now, at the same time, there was an American um, China, uh, there was an American China dream that would periodically take hold. And this had, was a belief that China was somehow on the verge of conversion to American ways. And one high point of that was when Chiang Kai-shek was in power in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, Chiang Kai-shek, as an opposite to the boxers, was somebody who had married a Christian woman, uh, Song Mei Ling, with deep ties to America, and had at least nominally converted to Christianity. And Chiang Kai-shek um, hated communism. He, um, he admired some things about the Soviet Union. He admired some things about Lenin. Uh, he liked Lenin's idea of a country led by a tightly controlled vanguard party, but he rejected um, communism per se. And he was lionized by Time Magazine. And Time Magazine through the years was often a place that um, published powerful versions of the American China nightmare and the American China dream. Uh, another image of the conversion was when Song Mei Ling and Chiang Kai-shek met with um, Franklin Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor Roosevelt and there were photos of particularly the kind of coming together the kinship or between um, these two two of the most powerful women in the world and Song Mei Ling um, was seen as somebody who could speak the language of Americans and she in fact gave a very powerful speech in English um, in the United States to, um, to Congress where she made the case for to Americans that fighting, um, that working together with China um, as it stood up to the invasion of Japan at the time when Japan was an enemy of Americans was something that Americans should understand that the two countries had uh, were fundamentally on the same page and had found a way to put their historic differences together and to behind them and to work together. Another time that the American um, China dream was in ascent was in the 1980s, when um, first of all Mao had um, Mao had gone from viewing the United States as the chief enemy in the world to having a break with the Soviet Union that allowed um, 
Nixon to go to China in the 19, early 1970s. And um, the two countries agreed that as different as they were, they shared a common enemy in the Soviet Union and could at least work together a bit. But Mao was still a figure who seemed very different in all kinds of ways from American uh, leaders. But then when his successor, Deng Xiaoping, um, rose in the late 1970s after a brief interregnum when another leader was in charge, Deng Xiaoping began to talk about how China should find a way to combine um, communism with, um, with market economy forces. He talked about reforming and opening China um, to the West. And he came to America in the late 1970s, and the great photo op of that, um, of that visit was when he donned a cowboy hat at a rodeo. This was seen to symbolize that Mao, who had always, along with everything else, dressed in a way totally unlike uh, Western leaders, wearing a, um, a Mao suit and a Mao cap. Here, Deng Xiaoping, still in that traditional um, form of um, Communist Party uh, dress, which actually came from Sun Yat-sen before the Communists and had links to um, other parts of the world as well, here was Deng Xiaoping showing his openness to somehow meeting America halfway by donning an American cowboy hat. And he said, did other things, he talked about opening markets to America, but even more so brought alive again these fantasies of the American China dream. And just as the American China nightmare was rooted partly in this ideas of China's enormous size that struck fear into Americans, the American China dream has often had a lot to do with size. Think of all those hundreds of millions of Chinese waiting to be converted to Christianity or at a later period waiting to be, become good consumers of American goods or maybe able to transform China into the world's largest democracy. Speaking of democracy, the next time that the American uh, China dream was particularly strong was during the protests of 1989, where among other uh, symbols, students rallied around a goddess of democracy that was based in part on the Statue of Liberty. Now, one example of how the dream and the nightmare builds on something that's actually happening, but exaggerates it, is that the Chinese students who took to the streets in 1989, a lot of what they said was calling on the Communist Party to live up to its own professed ideals. A lot of the banners they put up in Chinese talked about their anger at corruption and nepotism, not about a desire for free elections or other things that Americans could more directly relate to. Um, the goddess of democracy, even that, though modeled in part on the Statue of Liberty, also evoked traditional goddesses, a goddess of Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy. And it was carried into Tiananmen Square um, and into a place where white godlike statues of Mao had been carried uh, during the heyday of his rule. And part of their argument was not so much that we want to make our country like America, but rather we want to be able to have this be a country where we celebrate better values than veneration of one supreme leader, as happened in the heyday of Mao's um, personality cult. And they wanted a more just, less corrupt, version of the system um, that they had, a freer version of it, um, a better version of it, not a wholesale adoption. Um, only some of them were thinking in terms of any kind of wholesale adoption of foreign ways, but it was often interpreted in the, um, in the Western press at the time as though it were a movement to overthrow communism, as was being done in Eastern Europe at the time, not to improve the communist system. And it was often seen as one in which there was enormous admiration for the United States rather than some admiration for some American ideals, but also a desire to do things in another way. One symbol of the movement was um, the goddess of democracy statue, which may have spoken um, in many ways to the outward looking part of the, of the students. But the students rallied to songs such as um, Children of the Dragon, which were in part um, deeply patriotic, that talked about um, the chi China being a great country and being able to deserve to be governed in a better way. It was a patriotic movement as well as um, a cosmopolitan one.
So by the end of 1980, by the end of that movement, when it was crushed um, by tanks rolling into central Beijing, there was an odd moment of the dream and the nightmare um, coexisting at a moment. And the most famous photograph of that, um, that, that movement became in the West the one of a lone protester standing up uh, to a tank. Now, Deng Xiaoping, in whom the American dream, uh, dream fantasy had been invested not that long before, um, had called in the tanks, had been part of the leadership group, the leader of the leadership group that called in the tanks. But now he did not represent the China dream. He rather represented the American China nightmare. And it was the lone man standing up in front of the tanks who represented the dream. Now, another sign of, admir of, of uh, exaggeration came in here. The lone man was almost certainly a worker, but he was often described in the American press as a student because it was the students more than the workers during the protests who were on occasion talking about their admiration uh, for the American political system. And what brought workers out onto the streets was the fact that the students were also talking about uh, very pragmatic issues uh, to which people in all walks of life could relate such as nepotism and corruption. So there was a way in which uh, the symbolism of the American China dream stripped away things that didn't quite fit with it. Another way in which the dream and the nightmare have sometimes coexisted in the recent past is via the figure of Yao Ming. Yao Ming great, gained success in America as um, playing an American sport, basketball, which had a long history in China but was still associated with the West, and there was a sign of, of a happy kind of convergence, that dream that's long awaited for when he became a pitchman for McDonald's. At the other hand, the persistence of the idea of a, of a Chinese nightmare came when there were stories about Yao Ming that sometimes stressed that he was a product of um, the Chinese uh, official sports system. There were even stories about how um, his parents had been star athletes who had a kind of brokered marriage by um, the Chinese sports establishment to try to create a Frankenstein-like super athlete who could bring glory to China. And during the Olympics, Yao Ming was playing an American sport, but he was clearly presented as symbolizing um, the resurgence of Chinese greatness. With Xi Jinping, I think there's a divide, been a divided view of whether to view him as somebody who is more and more on the same page as Western leaders and part of the global order. And here again, sartorial things, just like Deng Xiaoping's donning of the cowboy hat come into play. After Deng Xiaoping, Chinese leaders began to more and more act like leaders from around the world in some settings, including dressing in uh, coats and ties, like those of male leaders around the world, and traveling sometimes, Xi Jinping more than his predecessors, with a wife in a role of the kind of first lady or accompaniment role um, that male leaders in other parts of the world often do. And this is something that wasn't really done by Xi's immediate pre predecessors, though it was done by Chiang Kai-shek at an earlier period. And Chiang Kai-shek was, of course, as I said, a time when the American China dream was in ascent. So when Xi Jinping with a stylish wife, Feng Li Yuan, travels uh, the world, and Peng Li Yuan, like Song Mei Ling before, gave a speech in English, one in America, that, that, that impressed um, many viewers uh, as well. This can be a kind of version of the American China dream. But there's also an American China nightmare that sees Xi Jinping as a new kind of leader of the unfree world. And these two ideas about Xi Jinping um, coexist, with probably now more of the fear um, than the fantasy, though early in Xi Jinping's rule, there was the hope that he would become more of a reformer, that he would liberalize the society. It's more of uh, the fear about him because his domestic policies, at least, have not gone in that direction. He has been had kept a tighter hold on freedom of speech and activities of that sort than his predecessors. Meanwhile, with all of this, I said there was a, a China-Japan seesaw effect. And I'll just mention that Time magazine covers and other propaganda at different points
when the China dream was in an ascent, would often show Japan as though it were um, like the, the place where these kind of visions of, of, of madness, like the boxer moment, were in ascent. In 1900, when the boxers were striking out against the West, Japan was part of the Allied armies that marched into China to suppress the boxers. So there was a kind of Japan, American Japan uh, dream that took hold. But at other times, there's been an American Japan nightmare. So during the 1930s and 1940s, when Chiang Kai-shek was being seen as the one who would be converting um, China to American ways, Japan was seen as the Asian country that was somehow unendingly uh, resistant to our ways. You see this idea that Japan at that point is seen as, as dehumanized while China is seen as humanized. But then after World War II, fantasies about Japan being the country that somehow, the country in East Asia, that can work together with the West, that were there in 1900, disappeared in the 1930s and 40s, these were back again in the 1950s and 1960s with an idea of a reborn Japan and probably not accidentally. Japan, when it, Japanese leaders, when they appeared on Time magazine covers then, were often seen with um, wearing clothes very similar to those that their Western counterparts would, would, would have worn. The differences at these moments is what I'm trying to say would be minimized the uh, parallels and connections emphasized. At the same time, the opposite was happening with China. Um, by the 1960s, at the heyday of um, fears of Red China in the early 1960s, Japan was being celebrated. And even when Japan was shown in um, as having cultural differences, exotic differences, these were seen as manageable exotic differences or things that even added to the country's allure because they were getting um, on the same page as the West in other ways, where it was America, even to the point of a geisha going bowling. By the 1980s, we see the seesaw moving in the opposite direction again, as Japan is being feared as a fierce competitor, as a country that somehow does things unfairly, and many of the economic fears that Americans now have about China, they had about Japan at that point. Japan was seen as kind of cheating in their engagement with the outside world. And again, it's not accidental that Japan was sometimes portrayed in ways that saw it as a dangerous mixing of old traditions and modern technologies. At the same time, in the 1980s, this was when China was being humanized on the colors, uh, covers of Time magazine, seen not as part of a faceless horde or not as a stereotyped throwback to evil old ways, but as relatable. Um, Deng Xiaoping's cowboy hat was one way of doing that, but even when Chinese were shown wearing clothing that set them apart, if they were drinking a Coca-Cola, they could be moving in the direction of conversion. In 1989, so there was the heyday of the American uh, China dream, but in 1999, there was a period when um, there was a momentary return of uh, the American China nightmare. And that happened when American bombs hit the NATO embassy, uh, the, the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, killing three Chinese. And Chinese students took to the streets and um, called out anti-NATO uh, anti slogans, called for a boycott of McDonald's and of Coca-Cola and of KFC. Um, in 1999, when I happened to be in China, at the time, I witnessed um, a virulent um, anti-NATO um, anti and anti-American um, movement. And at this point, one of the ways that seemed to symbolize how far things had gone from 1989 was that instead of a Statue of Liberty like Goddess of Democracy, there were images of the Statue of Liberty up on Chinese campuses that showed the Statue of Liberty as a kind of Nazi symbol, or in other ways, um, expressed uh, hatred of America. And there's one photograph I took then that I come back to often when I think about the dreams and fantas the dreams and nightmares. And this was of an image of a, um, of a Chinese youth, and the picture was fuzzy because I took the photograph very quickly, 
because it wasn't the easiest time to be an American taking photographs of a Chinese protest. But it showed an image of Che Guevara. And my first thought about this image um, when I showed it back to students in my classes back in the US was that this was the perfect um, t-shirt for the student to wear to an anti-American uh, imperialism protest. Che Guevara was known for his hatred of American imperialism. And at Yankee Go Home rallies around the world, Che Guevara can be a symbol um, that people rally to. But a student in one of my classes um, said I'd really misunderstood the, um, the, uh, the t-shirt completely. That yes, that was Che Guevara, but it was if you looked very closely, I mean, we used a magnifying glass to, to see this very carefully. It was a very particular image of Che Guevara that was on the student's shirt. It was on a, an image of Che Guevara that appeared on a Rage Against the Machine um, album. Rage Against the Machine was an American rock group known for its nonconformist music and its political stances. So what this, um, what this youth had done was pull a um, shirt from his collection that both had a radical figure, but also um, was probably the t-shirt of one of his favorite American uh, rock groups. And, and also looking more closely at this photograph still, um, his friend who came with him to that, uh, to that same um, rally was wearing a t-shirt that showed Kurt Cobain of the American rock band Nirvana. Um, somebody who was associated with youthful rebellion and they were youths taking part in their first protest but all but was not as associated as Che Guevara, particularly with um, critiques of American imperialism, and probably wouldn't have been seen that way at all uh, by these youth who were wearing, uh, going together to their first anti-American protest, wearing t-shirts um, that had to do with the American music they liked to listen to. So here we are at a moment early in 2017 um, in a time that's likely to be issues we're going to continue to struggle with going forward, where it's hard to figure out where to put Xi Jinping in this picture. And it's also hard to avoid um, overstating the degree to which either he's fitting into the global order or in which he's resisting it. Um, at the early part of the year, he went to Davos and he spoke about the value of globalization that China had realized that in the future it must be part of globalization, not block it. But he also um, has been doing things within his country, talking about the perfidious danger of Western ideas coming in, which is a throwback to an earlier period, even when he's talking about wanting to take China into the future. So it's important to both look for signs of ways of convergence and also of difference, and to think that globalization in the future will probably be one where China fits in with global um, structures in some ways, but also works to reshape them. That's what rising powers have often done. It's what the United States did when we were the rising power. There are things to worry about because of the particular agenda um, that China has um, deal due to factors such as um, strongly entrenched nationalism um, and a desire to be the leading power in the East Asian region unambiguously as it has been in the past and as it wasn't in times of Japan's ascent. But it's also just important to think about um, there being conflicting tendencies in uh, China as it goes forward and of this leader as it goes forward. Chiang Kai-shek, even when he was being lionized as somebody who was working to convert China to American ways, also spoke out against imperialism um, and not just that of, of Japan, but also at times of that of the United States. He was dependent on the United States, but he also um, wanted to see China independent. And um, there's more to the story almost always than a story of convergence or of impossibility of, of conversion. So here we are at a time when some of the photo ops show um, Chinese leaders and American leaders um, in sync with each other. And some of the times we hear um, a great, we hear rhetoric um, presenting the other as, a, as an enemy, whether it's um, American rhetoric describing China as cheating in the international arena and Chinese rhetoric saying that um, 
the American government is working to overthrow the Chinese government by supporting um, people who want to foster uh, culture, carry out cultural revolutions that would bring instability to China. It's a complicated moment. It's a complicated moment um, with many different figures in the world who are seen differently within China and within the United States. The Dalai Lama has become a kind of um, embodiment for many Americans of a great, of a kind of revamped version of the Chinese China American dream, a figure who represents a different and interesting way of seeing the world, but is completely in sync with the latest um, trends in the West. The Dalai Lama both speaks about religion and spirituality and is an admirer of science. He's not seen that way um, in China. In China, uh, Beijing at least, uh, he's seen that way by some people in the People's Republic of China, of course, but Beijing presents him in the official press as a complete throwback to a distant past and a worst past, sees him as a representative of an oppressive uh, form of theocracy, uh, theocratic rule in Tibet. There's a complete difference of ways of seeing these two figures, um, and that is one cause of uh, potential tension. There's also a completely different way of seeing um, China's, of Taiwan's leader. Um, the leader of Taiwan, the first um, elected leader, uh, female elected leader of an East Asian country without, um, without close familial ties to a previous leader. Um, she's widely admired by people who um, think about her in America. And she's seen as standing, in some ways, Taiwan can be seen as standing for an embodiment of the American China dream, a country that is Chinese um, culturally, but is very much in step with the world and embraces some values similar, similar to those embraced in the United States. Um, in Beijing, she's not seen that way at all. And the first source of tension um, between um, um, Donald Trump after he was elected and Xi Jinping, um, Xi Jinping's government was due to a phone call between Donald Trump and uh, the Taiwanese president, in which he seemed to be treating her as an equal head of state when Beijing insists that there is only one China and that um, under the idea of one China, there is only one true capital in Beijing, um, which is represented by there being only Beijing having representation in the UN and so on. Um, the thought was that, that the one China idea, which is a fiction that, Chinese, that American leaders have accepted uh, with a degree of vagueness that um, says they'll remain um, that they'll continue to um, have certain kinds of dealings with Taiwan while accepting the idea of there only being one China, um, an idea that took hold in part because when Chiang Kai-shek um, governed Taiwan, he also said that there was only one China, claiming that it was the China ruled out of Taipei, um, in which temporarily the mainland had ceased to be under the control of the legitimate Chinese government, while Beijing said that Taiwan was temporarily not under the direct control of the true Chinese government. Anyway, that one China policy um, had been a mainstay of American dealings with China for um, decades, and it allowed, it was a fiction, um, but a fiction that allowed things to go on in a certain way, with um, the American president having uh, direct dealings with the Chinese head of state and head of the Communist Party and having summit meetings and going to, to the mainland, while the American government also gave aid, particularly military aid, uh, to Taiwan and had other kinds of dealings with Taiwan. It seemed that that um, phone call would upend it all, but then once um, president, uh, following a pattern that was frequent of talking uh, tougher before entering the White House, than in the White House and doing things differently on the campaign trail than as president, um, Donald Trump said that the one, chi the one China policy would continue to be adhered to. Another, le another figure in Asia viewed totally differently in, um, in America and in 
on the mainland is Joshua Wong, the leader of the Umbrella Movement in Taiwan in 2014. He can see, be seen again as a kind of contemporary embodiment of a version of the American China dream, somebody fighting um, for democracy in Hong Kong, somebody open very much to the world, um, but Beijing sees him as a potential fomenter of a color revolution and sees the fact that he travels to America and speaks um, to um, American congressmen and the like as a sign that America is secretly um, is an enemy country operating sometimes as an enemy country trying to upend uh, stability in China. A final note needs to be said about um, one figure that helps keep Americans from going very far in the direction of the American China nightmare right now, which is Kim, Kim Jong un, North Korea's leader. Um, if any country right now is seen as a clear embodiment of the negative image of an East Asian country that in the past has often been projected onto China in the time of the boxers, for example, on Japan in the time of the kamikazes and World War II, for example, and onto China again during the 1950s and early 1960s um, when fears of red China and hatred of red China were the high, at the highest, it is now North Korea. And many of, the, many of the stereotypes that have been projected onto one or another East Asian country of complete conformity, of a scary combination of totally different views, irrationality, and mastery of the latest technologies is what we see now in um, the fears, which are rooted in things actually going on, but exacerbated by this history of um, projections is what is going on with the fear of North Korea.